Please welcome researcher, Stanford University, Jack Andraka. <laughs> Founder and president, Code to Inspire, Fereshte Ferro. And your moderator, CEO, editor-in-chief, and publisher, MIT Technology Review, Jason Pompton. You two have very different backgrounds, but what you share is an extraordinary passion for technology and its capacity to solve big problems. So we're going to talk about that and the, the world you hope to create by 2050. I want to begin with Jack, though. Jack, just to terrify folks, how old are you? Uh, I'm 20 now. And you, he's 20, and you have already created a, uh, a diagnostic test for pancreatic cancer. Yeah, so that happened back when I was 15, so now I'm super old. Uh, it's all downhill from here. But uh, basically, uh, when I was 13 years old, a close family friend who was like an uncle to me passed away from pancreatic cancer. And I found that there really weren't any ways to detect this cancer until it was far too late when you had less than a 2% chance of survival. So then using eighth grade biology and uh, a bit of ingenuity, I was able to come up with this new way to detect pancreatic ovarian and lung cancer that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. Wow. You are now a little older and a little wiser. So tell me what you know now that you would have done, that you would do differently. Uh, so I would definitely, uh, looking back, it's really nice to have these narratives of like, oh yes, 15 year old creates this new test. However, uh, what a lot of like stories uh, don't tell you is all of the work that went into that and making a, uh, sensor for these cancers is much, much more difficult than I originally anticipated and what I had anticipated even when I thought I had finished creating it. Like, I had this test, I was like, oh, it's perfect. And then, like, I was talking to all these different colleagues of mine and they're like, no, 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 you have to, like, change the biomarker that you're using, you have to change all this stuff. And it really shows that solving is very difficult, but we should also embrace that difficulty because it's when we're faced with that adversity that true creativity and innovation happens. Was the adventure the actual solving the difficulties and, and what was the biggest thing you got wrong? Uh, so probably the funnest uh, part about uh, doing solving and this I would say engineering uh, really is uh, I, I find it to be troubleshooting. Some people call me a masochist for saying that I just really love troubleshooting systems. Uh, but working out mistakes it, is a very fun time for me uh, for some odd reason. But uh, just kind of working out uh, what's going wrong and always improving upon your solution. But uh, the biggest thing I got wrong probably was my choice of biomarker. You got the protein wrong. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, initially, yeah. so I was talking, originally like I had selected this uh, biomarker called mesothelin, and it's like this ordinary protein, it's found in your bloodstream uh, at like these normal levels, but it gets super elevated when you have these certain types of cancers. At least that was what we thought back in 2011 when I started this work. Uh, but biomedicine moves fast, and by 2015, when I thought I had been finished, it was like, nope, mesothelin is actually like the worst. Let's do a different biomarker. And now it's towards a set of biomarkers. So kind of learning to like uh, roll with the punches, I would suppose, would be a big lesson. So we'll talk in a second what Jack is working on next. But before we do, Fresh Day, as the founder and president of the nonprofit Code to Inspire, you are trying to bring coding to young girls in Afghanistan. That seems, that seems like a hard job <laughs> to do. So talk about the challenges and, and how you surmounted them. Yeah, that's definitely a very difficult work because when you're talking about Afghanistan and then giving the women this access to technology, the very most important issue is you're talking about a country that it's been, uh, it, it went through decades of war and still is trying to uh, work towards peace and the women definitely were the main uh, victims of the wars and, and accessing the basic education is definitely still a, a very difficult thing for the women. Forget about if they want to go online, have access to computers or internet. So. Um, 
just like a quick thing that why I wanted to make quote to inspire and the challenges I faced. I was born as a refugee in Iran during the Soviet invasion to Afghanistan. And then I went back to Afghanistan and I got my master's um, in Germany in computer science and taught as a computer science professor for three years in, in the faculty. So as a woman, when I was studying computer science, I faced a lot of backlash from the community because I was vocal, I was active, and I, and I really wanted to be who I am. And I, and I just wanted to participate in a lot of work and um, and I saw that still the students, my students, the women are still facing. So if I say safety security is one of the big issues. So the women are technically stuck in their hometown. Mm -hmm. They can't uh, leave uh, their city because of the threat of the Taliban on the way. Not a lot of family allow their daughter to travel. Um, so you are just, the mobility is a big issue. And then um, definitely looking at the tech market in Afghanistan, which is growing, but still a lot of women can't participate or take job because it's a very male dominated, um, um, it's a male dominated sector but also uh, the women don't have enough experiences mm -hmm. because they don't have time to go and pursue extracurricular activities so they can compete with the male. So what I want to do is that I want to establish a safe and secure place that the women access the equal resources and then they can find job and employment online without being worried of any geographical or physical barriers so that they can bring income to the families. How do you communicate with young women in Afghanistan that this is even a possibility, that they can attend your schools, learn how to code, and become economically productive in their own right? So, uh so again, going back to being a refugee, a woman uh, teaching computer science in Afghanistan, what I really learned is the power of being online and internet and the communication. So that's how I felt very safe and secure to walk virtually in a world that I can express myself. Mm. Uh, and I thought that that's definitely the best idea for, uh, for the girls in Afghanistan. So um, we had girls that they come to our coding school with zero knowledge of English and computer. They never touched a computer. They never had internet. And now those girls can create websites uh, for other companies and they can create mobile application and games. So, um, so definitely, I think one aspect of, for them being online and feeling connected to the rest of the world, it's definitely very life changing. And then definitely the other aspects, which is bringing income through working online at the safety of your home or at the safety of this place is definitely a game changer for community like Afghanistan. How many young women have passed through your schools? 80, so we have 80 female students and this November we're gonna have the first group of our graduates. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Fresh Day is also a powerful advocate for digital currencies like Bitcoin. How does Bitcoin play a role in empowering women in Afghanistan? So one of the important aspects that we are looking is financial inclusion of women and, and being financially free and independent. So when you want to work online, which is a life-changing thing now, everyone wants to be online and do the work online. The other aspects is how you want to get paid. So in the other projects that I was involved, when we wanted to send money to Afghanistan, majority of the students don't have a bank account. Mm. And um, because, I mean, certainly everything is mainly cash-based in Afghanistan and also PayPal does not operate in Afghanistan. So if you want to work online in any online platform, you don't have this to. So you kind of like can access to that resources and the work. So what we did, we were like, let's find a solution and we learned about cryptocurrency as an example, Bitcoin. And then we start teaching the girls, they create the wallet, we start sending them Bitcoin and um, we, uh, we help them to cash out. The feeling that they never had um, a bank account, mm. but now they receive this virtual currency and they can cash it out and they can own it was amazing. A lot of the girls, they were like, wow, we've never felt so much empowered by having that. So that's the beauty of technology that like it's very fast. It's, it's, it's very fast. It's just like takes in a second, you mm. have it and you're like, yes, I'm part of the global economy and, and I can be part of uh, uh, this um, fast growing market. You were banking young women who otherwise had been unbanked, who would have found it difficult to get banking services, and they owned the money and no one could interfere with that. 
Yes, that's definitely something that was very empowering. We saw like the girls that they had this money, although I mean there were like some issues that mm. um, they wanted to help the family. Maybe some family wanted to have some shares of the money, but at the end of the story, once the woman be a breadwinner and bring an income to the family, forget about all that like financially being free, independent. Mm. It's the impact that she can bring to the house. She can be less towards the violence and she can be part of the decision making process of the family, which can help in a bigger way for the community. It's fascinating. Jack, I know you have talked about online access as a human right. And you have said that online access is essential to democratizing uh, innovation. In what sense is online access a right, like the right to speech or privacy or property is? And, and, how, and who guarantees that right? So I would uh, suggest that we don't think of right to internet as uh, like the right to the internet. It would be more the right to access knowledge. And the internet is the instrument by which to implement that. And uh, it's similar to, uh, I would say it would be almost analogous to uh, the public library system, especially in the US, where uh, we really have to rethink how we look at the internet. We have to rethink of it more of a public good than a private good that governments would ensure your access to. And then you could do add-ons to that where you could like increase your internet speed and things like that. But a basic access to information is essential not only for a functioning democracy, but also for innovation during research. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to do my research without access to the internet because it gives you the most up-to-date knowledge and you have like just endless knowledge at the like tips of your fingers. And that's an incredibly powerful concept. Who pays for this? Who is the, if, it's, if it is access to information is an important human right, who provides that access? Uh, so while this might be uh, politically challenging to implement, uh, I, would, I would have to say we would have to move it more towards a public good that the government would supply a basic kind of uh, platform of internet access. And that could be supplemented by different uh, corporate partners or different corporate uh, like entities that would like add on if you want faster internet. But like a basic access to internet would be established by governments, I feel. Are there downsides to open innovation? Are there things that might be unintended consequences? There, there definitely are uh, some like issues around like, for example, ownership or like also around like incentivization of uh, like to create uh, different innovations. So for example, like uh, one of the big motivations for patents are that like incentivizes the ability to like innovate and like has that funding. And so we would have to answer these difficult questions about issues of ownership when people are crowdsourcing technologies, who owns mm -hmm. that? Uh, and I think that is a kind of framework that still has to be worked out in the future. Firstly, what are your technological ambitions and hopes for the future? What are you working on now? So uh, with Code to Inspire, certainly I, uh, I want to establish a strong community of women in technology in Afghanistan. We have one center now in Herat with 80 students. We, uh, I want to expand in, in other cities in Afghanistan like Kabul, mazar sharif and create like this strong network of women that support each other and they can be future CEOs and entrepreneurs and they can create job opportunities with, with, um, uh, to other women in Afghanistan and also to the world. And, uh, um, and definitely, I would like to, through the technology, change the perspective of people looking at Afghanistan. Because when you say Afghanistan, a lot of people think about these dark images of war, destructions, violence, which we I don't deny we don't have, but we do have a lot of good and positive stories, which through this technology, I want to tell the world that we, we do have a lot of good stories. The young generation are going to bring peace to the community, and, and we want to build Afghanistan 2.0 with the girls who are coding. And you, Jack, what do you? <laughs> And you, Jack, what are you working on now? Uh, so now I'm, I got named to be a National Geographic Emerging Explorer, so now they fund all my research, which is really nice. And so uh, I <laughs> get to do all this. Uh, when, one of my big projects is we created uh, this thing the size of a postage stamp. It's this little piece of paper. You, and it could detect 28 different water contaminants simultaneously, and it costs one one hundred thousandth of, of, uh, one of a dollar. So it's like basically the cost of paper is the cost of this test. 
and uh, it will change colors instantly once it uh, is in the water, like, well, within a minute. Uh, and then you snap a picture of it, and uh, then you SMS text it, and then I create this program that will instantly analyze it, text back the results, and it can stack down to part per trillion ranges of these contaminants. And uh, then what you can do is it will geotag and timestamp all of those data points, and then you can create an interactive map of the pollution in your area over time. And thus, you're able to use these algorithms and tell exactly where certain contaminants are coming from. So we did this, we did a pilot site in Tanzania over the course of three months, and we were able to collect over 500,000 data points and hold 100 uh, corporations accountable for pollution. Dare I ask if you know what you want to do? <laughs> Dare I ask if you know what you want to do with your life? Do you want to be a physician? Do you want to be an inventor? I have absolutely no clue, and I'm still <laughs> figuring that out. So we'll see. I'm far from being a functional adult yet. <laughs> The mission of Solve is to convene extraordinary solutions and empower uh, solvers. Imagine for me the world of 2050, both of you, if technology could make a, a powerful difference. W what world would you like to see? I will picture a world without border, a borderless world where we are a digital citizen of the world and we have to, we don't have to be worried about all these physical and geographical boundaries. And we as humans all together as a digital citizen, we try to create this community that we help each other towards a peaceful uh, community worldwide. Um, so that's the world that I'm thinking with the technology uh, we definitely can achieve if you want. <laughs> and Jack? Uh, my kind of vision would be uh, where we can incorporate local stakeholders and really all relevant stakeholders into these decision-making processes. We saw with the Millennium Development Goals how unintended consequences from that as a result of not incorporating people who would like be affected by these decisions that led to all these unintended consequences. Part of my research is on analyzing how this precipitated into the Ebola crisis in West Africa. And so looking and uh, engaging these local stakeholders via like the internet and technology, communicative technologies like that, and bring those partners into the decision making process, that would really be my goal because if you don't bring in all the stakeholders, and inevitably some people are going to lose out. Well, Jack Freshte, we will follow your work. Thank you for giving me a subject to write about, and thank you for being solved. Of course, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.